Hello, I'm Cheryl Kuhlman. I'm the Managing Director of the Warden Social Impact Initiative, and I'm here in studio with Joey Hundred, who's the founder and CEO of Sustainatech. Welcome, Joey. Oh, thank you. Tell us about Sustainatech. What is it? Okay, Sustainatech is a company that produces indoor agriculture facilities and spaces. So we build uh, modular indoor farms to produce crops in places where it's very hard to grow crops. So think really harsh winters, uh, dry, arid regions, really hot places. We build indoor farms, typically inside of shipping containers that can be put anywhere to grow crops successfully where it can be hard to grow crops. And so who are the, the clients and consumers of these crops? Yeah, you got it. So in Canada, we grow lettuces and fresh herbs, and the clients are the everyday consumer. We're partnered with food companies whom we grow on behalf of, we package up the produce, ship it to them, and they ship it to the consumer. And then one of our customers is actually an ethnic group in Manhattan who requires produce a specific way. And so we grow the produce and ship it to them, and they ship it to people who eat it. So what are the latest trends in indoor container farming? I mean, is it, I know there's been a lot of discussion about how to make it work, different approaches, et cetera. Yes. What are you seeing? So what I'm seeing as trends in indoor farming writ large is it's attracted a lot of capital to the space. Because the idea is so interesting. It's true. The idea is unfortunately sexy. Ah. And the, the reason I say that is I think it's, it's whipped up a bit of a frenzy of interest in international media and in the capital markets, and it's chased a lot of money into the space. Now you might say, well, that sounds great, and I am happy about that. I'm not, I'm not worried, that's not the part I don't like. It's I think that um, there's unrealistic expectations of the companies in the space. Um, I think uh, some of the money's coming in from Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. where there's a, a, there's a belief that industries can be cornered and that uh, a winner-take-all uh, approach can be had. Uh, but when, you, when it comes to fresh food and agriculture, it is a hopelessly fractionated and diverse space for a reason. And so I, I think some of the trends that, I, that I'm concerned about with the arrival of so much money is companies are trying to scale into the hundreds of millions. So that they can drive out the others. Pretty much, which looks silly. Uh, but beyond that, I, I see core flaws in their technology, uh, in their whole approach, and I just worry what happens when you hit carbon copy uh, 300 million times on something. And uh, I worry about what the failure of some of these larger startups is going to mean for the rest of the market. And so we've been building our company uh, in, in, uh, while keeping in mind that this is happening in the market. And we've been offered, like most other of our competitors, a lot of cash. We've been uh, very conservative about what we will receive and what we will do with it, trying to build a more durable company that's going to last uh, until the market economics are proven. And that's the real critique. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and I know that even here in Philadelphia, there's a lot of interest in urban farming, right, yes. to sort of address the food deserts. And I think also then the fresh and healthy food, right? It's yes. how, how nice to get it from your neighborhood container farm yeah. rather than shipped from California. Indeed. Local food is probably what drove the initial interest in indoor farming. Um, however, the further you get into farming, uh, especially in the most developed nations in the world, if you look past the first or third uh, few hands into the food system, you find a massive industrial scale mechanized complex of farms and processors whose unit economics are amazingly low. You know, we're talking pennies per pound. When, you know, if you take a New York City, a Manhattan based urban farm, they need five to ten dollars per pound uh, just to turn the lights on. And so I'm worried that those farms that need 10 times uh, the amount per unit uh, are going to have trouble. And, and I think that uh, the, the industry has chased a few ideas. Uh, firstly, the vertical approach from Japan. Um, we, we've built vertical farms. Uh, I've built non-vertical farms. Uh, the non-vertical farms are much more capital efficient than the vertical ones. If we were building in Hong Kong, I would totally go vertical. But the places in the world where you need to go vertical are not many. And then the other piece is everybody chased lettuce because lettuce and leafy greens grow so fast. But it's also created a flood of product and still competing with the produce from the field and from the greenhouses is incredibly hard. So I think those two things, vertical growth and chasing greens, have steered indoor agriculture companies um, after some unattainable goals. Well, and you know, you're talking about then the financing around this, you know, yeah. uh, venture capital chasing this, pushing it. How else can an entrepreneur get the funding to make these these ideas happen? You got it. For farming and for other kinds of initiatives. Yeah. So, you know, 
Silicon Valley has created the, the, the well-paved, smooth-running highway of capital available to technology-based ventures um, in, uh, globally, but certainly in North America. And that is nothing to complain about. It's made it much more affordable for ventures like mine to go after capital. Uh, the agreements are standardized. The investment tools are standardized. The lawyers know what they're doing. And there's many, many investment shops. And that is super cool. So I, I think that we've benefited from that. And we'll continue to benefit from it. And I'm glad it's there. I al <laughs> but I also built my company differently. Um, before heading for equity financings, w you know, indoor farming is a very high capital cost industry. If I was to have sold equity from day one, I would have three percentage points in the company left. Uh, I would have been diluted right out of it. And so we found um, other ways of financing the company. Uh, one was uh, we would, we, the first thing we did was sell an entire indoor farm on contract. So we found a buyer of a very specific kind of indoor farm, and we sold that farm. And that injected uh, cash into the company and let us, uh, the first two, two and a half years of the company were built on just that contract. And it did let me get into the game and really see what was going on. Then we scored a contract to ship produce to a company. And it, it, you can finance contracts if you know what your cost of production is, right. if you know you can make money at it. Uh, it may be hard to go find a buyer of this produce, but is it any less hard than going and chasing capital when you have no value? I found it easier to go find a customer for the produce that was willing to pay a really high price for the quality. And we grew uh, for three years on that. And so we didn't even open up our cap table uh, until year five. And then we started raising equity capital with a valuation I could stomach. And I, and I want entrepreneurs out there to know uh, there's other types of capital out there. Sometimes countries will fund technology companies to make sales in other countries. Sometimes Why would they do that? Because they want the export revenue. Ah. Countries love export revenue. It's awesome for GDP. And a lot of countries in the advanced world have a, a terrible imbalance in imports and exports. And so there are funds available to assist in export of technology and crops. And you know, I, I think for me, what I would have done differently and what I encourage entrepreneurs to do, uh, I would have gone to the major, major trade shows sooner to find out how specialized uh, a lot of these buyers are and that you can get forward contracts on a lot of this stuff. There's, it's a different way of going about it, but I would rather build uh, value and ultimately uh, build more equity before approaching VC. Um, yeah. Especially in a high capital, you know, high capital expenditure business. Yeah, that's such an interesting approach because I think a lot of the student entrepreneurs we're seeing, and then even the ones we're reading about, they're going after the venture capital right away. They're, Immediately, they're sort of thinking that that's the, you know, it's it's a long shot, but if you get that quick hit, you're set, right? You know, uh, one of our competitors raised 128 million dollars uh, a month and a half ago um, in a Series B. Um, there was a competitor last year that raised 200 million in a Series D. Man, does that change life. You know, what, what life was like before that round and after that kind yeah. of a round, uh, that is a way different existence. And again, if the unit economics were there, great. Uh, but I think an entrepreneur has to ask themselves, uh, what are they in it for? Uh, did they do it for that, to become instantly corporate, a board filled with very serious people um, and uh, specific goals and KPIs that if you don't hit, you don't have that much time to mess around when there's a couple hundred million at play. Uh, whereas, you know, at 20 to 60 million at play, I think there's more uh, flexibility to go after more profitable ends and niches in the market. It's a global market. Agriculture, you know, fresh produce is massive, and you can even process the produce making an essential oil or a tea or a dried herb or a nutraceutical, it opens up global markets. Um, and so the further I've gone, the more happy I am with the choice not to play in the commodities of, of these farms. Well, and I, and I think um, you've been come visiting us as the Nazarian Innovator in residence this year, it's official, but you've been with us for seven times, yes, right? We've, yes. So we've seen your development along the way. Yeah. And the one thing I know about you is you are uh, for at your core, somebody who likes to make improvements, right? Yes. So the last thing, I could see why you would say, I'd rather have the freedom to continue to change, yeah. explore and develop, rather than get the money that forces me to scale in ways that I'm not, I'm not comfortable exactly with. Exactly right. right? If, I, if, if, if I had an opportunity a year ago to take on lots of capital and scale massively, if I had scaled with those ideas, um, I'm sure we could have pulled out the win of some kind. Uh, what we broke through to technically in the last nine months, even the last six months, 
it is amazing what we've done. And I, I'm, I'm, thank gosh, I can head after those opportunities now. We're already writing contracts on them. The margins uh, eclipse that which we were doing before. It also embeds more of a purpose piece in what we were doing. It's, it's continued to change the nature of the company. And, and we're in the millions. It's not like there's small opportunities. It's that if I, like some of my competitors, had to just scale what I was doing a year ago, um, I wouldn't be anywhere near as confident as I am today that the profitability is really there. And that gives you a great deal of flexibility in thinking about what you're going to do next, who you're going to approach, and, and how you're going to structure your next, your next rounds. Absolutely right. And it changes the type of investors that we're approaching and making sure that we're, we're you know, as exciting to those investors as we've ever been. But if anything, our investors are feeding back that they get confident with the more clarity that we're seeing the global market with. It so what kinds of trends are you seeing in investors? I mean, yeah. you've, um, I know you funded your first initiative, the sustainable, the, yes. the carnival, through more traditional nonprofit grants yeah. and kind of sponsorships, right? Indeed. And so how are you seeing that transition going? Is there more blended capital, yeah. more venture capital? What yeah. So uh, I would say that I mean, venture capital is incredibly mature at this point. It's also a great time to be raising money. A lot of these funds are flush. Sure, there's, there's a concern out there about a coming recession. Um, however, there's funds that have just closed their rounds. Uh, they have three and four and five years of dry powder to spend. Um, so I'm seeing lots of capital. I'm seeing new private equity shops pop up every day that I didn't know about. A lot of them are getting even more purpose built uh, for food, for robotics, for tech, for pharmaceuticals. Like they're, 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 or even the venture arms of big corporates. They're, they're going at a purpose, and they're, they've got these sidecar funds of fifty, a hundred million dollars to go at a purpose. It, it, the, the, the ecosystem is so differentiated and flush. Um, and but be, beyond that, I think that some investors are wary of the companies that say we're going to lose money for fifteen years. And you're going to need to pour in $10 billion, but then, boy, are we going to boil the ocean. I'm seeing some skepticism about that now. There's no question that some of these unicorns have blitzscaled to the $50 billion mark, and everybody looks at Uber and looks at Airbnb and looks at Amazon and says, see? You can do it. Right. But what about the 30,000 ventures that didn't get anywhere close to that? And, and uh, what's wrong with a 10x or a 30x? Why does it have to be a 700x? I'm seeing some skepticism in the capital markets about companies that say, what we're tackling is so huge and fundamental for society, someday we're going to make money and just bet on us and keep betting on us. I'm seeing the preference for some investors to see some business savviness along the way. Can you cash flow the venture? Is it profitable? When are you going to reach profitability? Can you do it a bit sooner? Can you access traditional bank financing? These are questions that are being asked to us and something that I've been seriously considering. Because for a high capital cost business, if I can get bank financing, that's the cheapest non-dilutive capital that I could ever hope for. So I've been working with banks to start to line that up because every dollar I borrow for our systems is a dollar I didn't have to raise for equity capital. So I think that the high of we'll make money someday is actually behind us. And I'm seeing more value consciousness amongst um, certain VC shops, institutional VC shops. Yeah. Well, I'd like the point you made about purpose right? yeah. and more uh, entrepreneurs and investments going towards that. We have our radio show on Sirius XM, Dollars and Change, and we've been doing it for about five years. And one of the things that we continue to see and, and our uh, hypothesis is that the more funding that can go towards these purpose companies, yeah. the more likely entrepreneurs are to think about that as an opportunity. Yeah. You know, it proves that the concept that you can have a business that has yeah. a purpose, you know, makes a positive social impact and can still make money. Yes. And if you show that that's possible, oh, yeah. I think that inspires more the entrepreneurs to think about how to make that happen. I would it's, agree. it's more fun to solve problems like oh, that. Yeah. Right? It is. I think it's in the heart of people. You know, when I come to Wharton, I always like to take the pulse on what I'm hearing around here. What's clear is the concept of impact investing itself has matured here. Yeah. People are looking at Wharton and looking at WSII. They're coming here for that. I've talked with uh, a couple dozen students that came here because of WSII. I know. I love hearing that. It's amazing. You know, I didn't used to hear that. Right. And they came here to learn about impact investing. I've even heard students say, I'm going into X big firm, big banking, big consulting firm, and I want to take these methodologies with me. I want to promulgate these ideas inside of large global firms. I mean, that's exciting. And you know, Wharton's one of those schools where that can actually come from. Right. And, and, it, and students can carry it into those industries. I also, yes, I'm hearing a lot of uh, 
the desire to blend purpose into venture um, more and more, and but more sophisticated than I did in the past. Um, it's more concrete. And in our company, yes, we've had purpose on our minds the entire time. And there's that terrible tension between making the company work and float and staying at the purpose. And one needs the other. And sometimes you prioritize one or the other. And I admit, much of the last six years was just making this thing technically work so that I could uh, again, point back more directly at purpose when we could afford it, but most importantly, when the purpose made money to focus at. And to me, that's the most virtuous blend. If you can get the purpose to make money and actually be inspiring from a profitability standpoint, that's Maximus, right? That's, that's the best collision. And so when one isn't taking away from the other, I admit that is very hard. And we've done things just for profitability while I've had some purpose on my mind. And this year we've begun to redevelop uh, those programs and they're global in nature, they're big. It's a big lift, um, but we've restarted those programs that um, have purpose and profitability baked right into them. That's great to hear. Yeah. So what kind of closing advice would you give to an entrepreneur in this exciting, you know, innovative, flush time for yeah. them to think about how to be most successful? Yeah, uh, I would actually, um, report on something I've seen here at Wharton, which I'm, I'm inspired by. I've been coming for eight years, and I would say this year, I'm hearing the most um, likely candidates for success in uh, venture than I've heard in years past, specifically because somewhere, somehow, feedback came back to the cohort of students here, get more specific, niche out, pick a niche and pick a product um, that is specifically built for something. I used to come in here, it's the Uber for this, it's the Airbnb for that. Um, and while there was lots of passion and energy that would concern me, because you, you cannot boil the ocean and, and make your way. This year, I'm hearing about B2B plays on the most obscure things, uh, switches and, 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 and SaaS services for categories I didn't even know existed. How students are finding this within weeks and months, it tells me something's trained them to look at the product problem more carefully and to look deeper into the market to find real problems instead of reading Fast Company and being like, I want to be like that. I'm heartened to see this shift towards more specific uh, niche high growth opportunities. And that's my advice back to entrepreneurs that might listen to this. Pick a niche, pick it carefully. You're not expected to know right away. Uh, go deeper into the field, deeper into the market, meet players at trade shows, stay curious, ask tons of questions. Eventually those apertures of real pure opportunity are gonna open up and they may have not have been visible to you in the beginning. They may even be totally uninteresting to the general population, but they could be super profitable and easier to build a moat around and easier to capitalize. And, and I like that movement. I like the movement towards specificity, niche-based high profit opportunities instead of trying to boil the ocean. Well, thank you so much, Joey. It's been a pleasure having you here. Thank you thank for having you. me. For more insight from Knowledge at Wharton, please visit knowledge.wharton.upenn.edu.